All right, my name is Val Davis. I've lived in Missouri most of my life, except for six years in the Air Force. I've been to England uh, while I was in the Air Force. My first experiences were around Dixon, Missouri, my hometown. I grew up part of the time there and part of the time in Kansas City. Uh, and probably 63, 64, maybe 65, somewhere in there. The first thing I ever noticed, my uh, I had an uncle who was no nonsense, very down to earth guy. Uh, we went down to my uncle Edward's cabin, barbecue, and they were fishing and stuff. Us kids were playing. My uncle Buck's two daughters, both of whom are now deceased, Kay and Judy, were. You know, we rode back to town with my uncle, and my aunt was in the front seat. Uh, we went the gravel roads, a road called Jones Creek Road. Uh, my uncle didn't drive fast. Well, that night, it was after dark, all of a sudden, my uncle said, everybody duck and don't raise your heads. And then he started driving like a maniac for about two miles until we got to the highway. I did sneak a peek and I saw two big black shapes. Don't know if that's what he was afraid of or what, but I've never seen him afraid other than that night. Uh, fast forward a few years, the area up by Dixon where we used to uh, rabbit hunt and squirrel hunt during the day. I roamed the woods all around Dixon for years. Never saw or heard anything. Well, I went rabbit hunting down there, and that was probably in 73, 74. Saw something on a hillside. It was just a gray blur, probably about six and a half foot tall, moving faster through the underbrush than a human being or a horse could have, and hardly making any noise at all going through it but it was at full run and it was heading away from me. My first thought actually, because I hadn't thought anything about a Sasquatch or anything like that, Bigfoot, I thought of a gibbon, because it was slender built. But they can't move that fast. Right. This, this thing was like hyper fast. Was it going uphill? Uphill across the ridge away from me. Well, for some reason, no one ever hunted down in there at night. And us kids, we did it in the daytime. We never thought about it. Uh, let's see. 75, I found out from the Oregon Bigfoot website, there was a sighting. A creature walked past a trailer just a quarter of a mile from my uh, uncle's house which was across the railroad tracks in this wooded area along Highway 28. The big wooded area, and, and there's some glades in it. It's probably half mile wide, half mile deep. Is that national forest or um, private? Nope. I have no idea. I think maybe the railroad might own it. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know. Uh, there's an old foundation down in there I ran across once where there had been a cabin probably but uh, that's all right and uh, anyway the Oregon Bigfoot site had a report turned in in 1975 by the people in the trailers just down the road it walked across the highway and then hopped the railroad tracks down into that wooded area uh, she described it as a Bigfoot, but she didn't say whether it was tall and skinny or if it was broad-shouldered. Mm -hmm. uh, went down there quite a few times, daytime, except for that one sighting of the thing running across the hillside. Didn't find any tracks. Uh, probably saw some tree breaks, just figured they were natural, didn't pay any attention to them. Then, in probably 76, uh, heard some guys pull in. I was 
with a buddy of mine, we were fishing on a pond, had a 10 acre open field between us and the railroad tracks. They pulled off a of Highway 28 next to the railroad tracks. Probably had been drinking a little bit, but they unloaded some coon hounds, uh, four or five dogs, and uh, they were talking, yeah, them chicken shits here in Dixon won't hunt back there. Gotta be a lot of raccoons. We're gonna make a lot of money tonight. Uh, they went up over the railroad tracks into the wooded area and the dogs were on trail immediately. And uh, they might have been gone three minutes. Heard the dogs beat them back to the truck. Saw the headlamps bobbing as they came running out of the woods at full blast, tripping over the railroad tracks to get to their truck. Uh, one guy said, uh, what was it? What, what, what was that? I don't know, but the dogs beat us back to the truck. I'm not going back down in there. He said, and I know my dogs would tree a bear. They've done it before. So they jumped back in the truck, loaded the dogs, jumped back in the truck, and they bailed out, headed back wherever, wherever they were from. Anyway, uh, you know, I knew local hunters didn't go down in there at night because of something, but I didn't know what they would talk. Uh, go down there and uh, hunt during the day, you were fine. Start getting dark, you start getting an uneasy feeling. Tried to camp out down there one time. Decided, well, I'm not going to be scared out of here. Uh, took my dog Thor, who was a husky, and uh, Collie and Wolfhound mix I had that uh, weighed about 90 pounds. Went down there, uh, probably quarter of a mile, half mile. There was a couple of uh, wet weather runoffs between the hills that came to a point, and there was a triangle-shaped island where the water had cut out around them about three foot deep. Well, somebody had dropped some tree, a couple of trees on that island to sit on, but I uh, have no idea who did it because nobody ever went down there at night. Anyway, we decided, yeah, that little island would be good. We'll throw our tent up and we'll put, build a campfire. We can sit on those logs. Uh, about 11 o'clock, my little husky backed into the fire we had to put him out throw water on beat the flames out because he caught his fur on fire and was still growling intently across the the wash out uh, the collie and wolfhound who didn't bark at people at all was up every hair standing straight up you could see his gums he was snarling so hard and he made a circle around us following heavy footfalls out in the edge of the woods where we couldn't see it. He went all the way around us. By the time he came back around where he started, we already had everything packed up and we were ready to haul ass. Because yeah. whatever it was was stomping around was big and, you know, breathing sounded like a horse that was running for a while. It was heavy. Right. Anyway, uh, we took off out of there, my Husky. As soon as we got to where we could see the railroad tracks and the street light in town, he'd been between our feet, he was gone. Up over the tracks, they wasn't worried about us. The Collie and Wolfhound stayed behind us, backing up the whole way, growling. We got over the railroad tracks, he hauled ass to the house, but we were in town by then. Uh, all right, your cousin? Well, I kind of messed that up because my cousin James was with me with the Husky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there was an incident before that with his brother Jeff. We went down in there. We didn't go as far in. And we got scared out of there. Uh, you know, I coon hunted several places, but I knew from the old coon hunter that I hunted with that I bought my dog from, there were places they didn't go. And it was just common knowledge. You don't go into that holler. You don't go down along that slough. You don't do it. And I've heard that too in a lot of areas. Do you think people know that there's just danger in there and they've had strange experiences that they can't explain, that they just say, don't go down in there, rather than they know it's actually Bigfoot? It's just more I, of... I think a lot of them... Uh, they just don't want to admit there's anything they don't know about. 
Right. They laugh at the conservation department because they know there are black bears, they know there are mountain lions, they've known it all along, uh, but uh, they're just not going to admit they're afraid either. You know, they're, they're, they got their little macho society, yeah, I coon hunt. I trapes all over the woods, woods at night. Okay, how about over here? Nope. Right. They're not going to talk about it. Yeah. And a lot of people, when they've seen something like this, they won't talk about it. They just deny it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, scientific method says it takes three forms of evidence, and it's a fact. You got tracks, you got hair samples, you got eyewitnesses, and there's been DNA studies. Mm -hmm. You know, they come back as some type of human being with on the mitochondrial side and on the uh, other side of the DNA, it's uh, unknown. Right. Uh, they're out there, you know. What we encountered down in those woods that night, I'm not sure, you know, what it was. It sounded heavy, could have been Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Could have also been the other critter. Uh, my cousin Jeff and I went back down there in 77 to camp out. I was with uh, his younger brother James when we had the Collie and Wolfhound and Thor with us. Well, I had an imported German Shepherd. And they're a totally different dog than what we have here in the States. They, they are no-nonsense, nerves of steel, cold-blooded twice as strong as an American bred dog. They got jaw power, they can crush a wolf's jaws. That's what they were bred for, was to kill wolves. Mm -hmm. Protect the stock and kill wolves. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we just dropped over the edge of the railroad tracks in a little hillside glade, maybe, maybe 100 yards from the railroad tracks. We could still see the top of one of the street lights over the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to see, you know, if anything popped up. We built a little campfire. There's a cedar tree inside the campfire that was light that was about 20 feet tall. Well, we're sitting there about 11 o'clock and all of a sudden this possum comes running between me and the campfire. The old dog's down here. I had a pup about 18 months old. He's up here. Jeff's on the other side of the fire. You know, so all four corners around the fire had something in it. It went around the pup, past me, between me and the fire. I wasn't six feet from the fire. Wild animals don't go near fire. It went past the old dog, hit that cedar tree, and went up it like on a dead run. And it was sitting up there, needles were falling, it was shaking so hard. You know, and this is a possum. They're not really all that intelligent, but it was terrified. Uh, looked over at my cousin. He said, uh, that's not cool. And I said, no, it's terrified. About that time, the old dog, the German dog, Midnight, jumps up, runs down the hill where the drainage was, uh, right at the edge of the fire light, and roared and I had never heard him made a sound like that. It was not a bark, it was not a growl. He drew in all of his breath and roared. And whatever it was, probably wasn't 30 feet from him back in the brush where we couldn't see it, stomping around, inhaling, exhaling, and every time it moved, he'd roar again. What did the roar sound like? Like a lion or a bear? No, similar, yeah. Yeah. Just a... Uh -huh. Yeah. Did you know? it sound uh, human-like? I'm no, not this, saying it was this, a person, but I mean like... This was like, the dog roaring. Oh, the dog. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I've never I have never heard a dog make loud, a noise that loud. Yeah. He do all, drew all of his breath in and told it, back off. Right, okay. And uh, he wasn't afraid of it. Mm -hmm. That's the only time I've had a dog that wasn't. And the whole time, this being's doing circles around you? No, this, this, he was down at the bottom of the hill. He was focused on the dog. Mm -hmm. And he might have been wanting that possum for food. I don't know why. Right. But uh, anyway, 
Uh, we got everything gathered up real quick. The pup, first time midnight roared, the pup was gone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was up over the railroad tracks headed for home. Yeah. I called midnight and uh, he came back part of the way and it must have moved again because he roared again and started back that way and I yelled, no, and come on. And uh, we went back up over the railroad tracks and went home. Right. I couldn't get my my cousin Jeff to hunt down in there with me during the day or nothing after that. Yeah. You know, he was done. A year or so later, uh, maybe 77, 78, went back down there with my cousin James again. My cousin Jeff, his older brother, wouldn't go at all. James and I go down there and we're walking through during the day. Had a lot of dead tra trees along the trail. And they weren't that big and they were real dead, so we pushed some of them over just to see what would happen. Went back the next day, it looked like a tornado had went through there. Limbs twisted off, trees that were four to five inches in diameter twisted and snapped over. Uh, clear message, don't do that again, this is my territory. Uh, incident happened I'm thinking in 76, I forgot that. I mentioned the sighting on the Oregon Bigfoot website of mm -hmm. the thing walking across into those woods. Well, I went down to my Uncle Buck's house, dropped over the woods, didn't take a dog with me that day because uh, I didn't want to take a dog along to distract anything. And I'm squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, usual. Go over the hillside, and there's a big glade down there with, uh, I forget what they call them, little rock outcroppings about a foot and a half high at the bottom side of the glade. Uh, there's cedar trees growing on the top above those rock outcroppings. And then there's another little stretch of grass, about 10, 12 foot wide. Well, all the rocks in that meadow, and some of them three or 400 pounds, I thought somebody had been in there with a bulldozer, you know, bought the property and was going to do something because there's so much upheaval in the ground. And I get to looking, no, they've been, I figured, okay, black bear looking for grubs because they've been ripped, you know, ripped, ripped out of the ground and flipped over. Uh, I found where whatever it was had squatted down like a power lifter with its paws rotated inward. A bear can't put its paws like that. Mm -hmm. This thing squatted down, reached under with its front claws, and ripped the rock out of the ground, flipped it over. Right. Okay, it had, uh, and it left good clean tracks where it did that. They were 12 inches long, 12, 13 inches long, eight inches across the spread of the toes. All the toes were the same size, and there were claws on the end of them. So that was not a Sasquatch footprint. Okay. That was whatever David Thompson tracked in Canada in 1813. Right. Anyway, it had claws on the front too because they were stuck under the rock. You could see where they dug through the ground to get under the rock. And it, like a power lifter, surged upward and flipped that rock out of the ground. I went and got another cousin of mine, cousin Chet, and brought Chet down there because I wanted somebody else to see this. Plus, I owed him something. I don't scare the shit out of him because a little smart ass. Anyway, Chet comes down there with me and we're looking around and he found the track behind the cedar tree. He said, hey, it was standing here for some reason. And you see both footprints had been standing there behind that cedar tree and it was right at the edge of the strip of cedar trees there had been a deer, we found the deer tracks, and the deer went from seeing whatever was behind that cedar tree, the first jump was over 20 feet. It made three jumps from the two footprints where it was standing to the next one, to the next one. It took four jumps, 15 feet from one footprint to the other and the deer went down and there was blood and hair all over the place. And then it picked it up and carried it off. That had to have happened 
between when I first went in there that morning and when we got back down there. So that thing was still in the area. And my cousin's like, let's get the hell out of here. And I, I, I agreed with him. All I had on me was my 22 pistol. No, I'm leaving. So we went on out of there. Uh, so what year are we at right now? Because you're going through kind of a timeline, right? Well, 79 was when I worked at the Park Service. And that's when I had the thing behind me in the woods, you know. Caught Ben scaring people and scared the hell out of him okay, and all so that. So that's 79. Yeah. Okay. And then from that point to where you're getting ready to start off at, what year are we at now? Uh, Roughly. Doesn't have to be exact. Well, I went in the Air Force. I was gone for six years. No experiences in New Mexico or any place like that. Mm -hmm. uh, probably just 80, 87 or 88. Okay, 87 or 88. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah, um, another thing kind of tell the time of year because I feel like that's important because for me a lot of sightings take place around June or July in Missouri it's real green yeah uh, I mean there are winter sightings oh yeah experiences but when they really decide to interact they really get confident with the yeah. green I think most of the time uh, when they're interacting a lot of it's the juveniles it's kind of like with the Native Americans you know they used to love sneaking up and leaving something next to the guy's head just to show him they'd been there and scare the hell out of him counting coup as they called it mm -hmm. i think these things do the same thing are you talking about like um, the frontiersmen like when they were sleeping mm -hmm. the natives would sneak up and place something next to him oh, yeah. just let them know that they're watching or take something from him okay yeah you know huh, interesting and i think the these are these are human beings are they're different than we are but they're still in the human range mm -hmm. they're highly intelligent uh you know, everybody talks about, oh, if they were there, you'd see them more often. Go out in the woods sometime with a Navy SEAL. See how many times you can spot him. Right. If he disappears, he disappears. You know, these things, they live it. Yeah. You know, they're not trained to do it. They live it. Yeah. And if you're going to know that the Navy SEAL's there, it's probably going to be because he let you know it. Right. I They... Outdoor Life magazine had this picture taken in a swamp. You got five Navy SEALs in the picture. I looked at that picture. I went over it with a magnifying glass. I got out my jeweler's loop. Couldn't see them until they circled them. And then it's like, you gotta be shitting me. And they were there the whole time in the picture. You know? Right. Yeah, and the, the Sasquatches, it's just like they're wearing a giant ghillie suit. Yep. And I, I have sat on a hillside, got a little bit of shrub in front of me, you know, a little small tree of some kind that's spread out. Mm -hmm. Got very few leaves on it. I'm sitting on the hillside, not 50 feet from a buddy of mine walking down the trail. And uh, I'm in denim jacket and blue jeans, faded out blue jeans, you know, faded denim. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting on this rock. And I decided, you know what, I'm gonna put an arrow right between his feet. Well, I didn't. He moved his foot differently than what I feared he was going to. I knocked a heel off his boot. Oh, wow. Well. Where the hell are you? Yeah. And I'm sitting there. I didn't move a muscle after I let go of the arrow. He's, damn it, where the hell are you? Right here. Didn't do anything but say it. And he's looking right at me. Where? I stood up. He says, Jesus, you scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Being motionless. People, they look right past. Most people see motion. Mm -hmm. You know, my girlfriend spot deer standing still that I never see. But if an ear twitches, I got it. Right. You know, I see motion really well. Mm -hmm. But if it's standing still, not twitching, I may not see it. Oh. Unless the limbs are moving and it's not, and I'll catch that. Right, I'm the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I look for movement. Mm hmm. All right, well, um, yeah, let's get into the next part of your encounters. Okay. was hiking, hiking at night with a friend of mine. I did a lot of that. 
just hike the gravel roads out of town five or six miles and hike back in talking. Uh, had a big yellow German Shepherd, Viking weighed 125 pounds, uh, really quiet. He could scare the hell out of you if you're sitting in the woods with dry leaves all around. He'd walk up and stick his nose in the back of your neck without you ever hearing him come through six or seven inches of leaves. It was like a ghost. Didn't let anybody else touch him but me though. He'd had an experience as a pup, and if they backed him into a corner, he would have ran over him or tore him up. He just didn't want to be touched. He didn't even want me touching him most of the time. Anyway, a friend of mine, James Cox from Dixon, we're out walking. We go out of town on a gravel road, walked out uh, four or five miles, and then we're going to hike back on uh, BB Highway, or no, 133 Highway. Well, about uh, three miles from where we hit the highway, we come back, uh, we, we're hearing heavy footfalls. But there's fields and there's cows, so we just figured it was cows kind of following us along. Viking wasn't paying any attention to it, so we figured, yeah, it's just cows. Because they were really heavy footfalls and there was some breathing. There's a place that's called uh, well, it's, it's where BB Highway comes from Iberia, Missouri, and hits 133 Highway. They have a pull-off area. They, now, this is a long time ago, but it's still there. There's still a pull-off area. There was a street light at that time and an old foundation. It was a moonlit night. Still hadn't seen anything. We got to the junction, and we're out on the pavement, standing on the pavement. Viking charges at something growling and suddenly stopped, went maybe 60 feet, stopped and ran backwards. His tail dropped and he ran backwards to us. And, you know, we're like, what? This thing walks past this pine tree, which there are very few in that area, and its head is visible over the limb that's sticking out. Shoulders probably four foot wide, maybe five. I mean, it was enormous. I'd say six to 800 pounds easy. Uh, what color was it? Well, even with the moonlit night, it looked all black. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it had any other color to it or not. Yeah. Could you tell if it had the conical shaped head or more of a round? There head? was kind of a point to the head. Okay. And the head did not stick up above the shoulder muscles hardly at all. Yeah. Eye shine? Didn't see any eye shine because okay. it was walking away from us. Okay. Uh, it stepped off down into the woods. There's an old foundation there, old concrete foundation. It went past that 25, 30 foot in the woods. It was you know, not visible anymore. But uh, we both saw it. We went back the next day. That's how we determined it was over eight foot tall because that branch was exactly eight foot off the ground. So it was eight and a half, nine foot tall, easy. And probably the biggest thing I've ever seen in the woods. I've seen others, but nothing as massive as that one. Right. Uh, Anyway, we walk on back into town, and like I said, Viking wouldn't let anybody touch him. Well, James is like, we did see something, because Viking's right in between us, and James is reaching down and touching the top of the dog's head, and he's looking around. He's not even paying any attention to it. Mm -hmm. Next day, James come over. We were talking about it, and we are going to go out and measure that limb. He couldn't get near Viking. It's back to normal. Uh... That incident, the first time I actually saw something, even though all I saw was the back of it, I know what I saw. There's no doubt about it. That thing was enormous. Right. I've heard stories like in Canada and Alaska off of a, how to hunt. And, you know, brown bears, grizzly bears, they're really, really aggressive. And I hear when these things are around, they'll haul ass and take off running yep. away, you know. So. Yep. It makes sense because I understand, yeah, I've been around certain shepherds that are 
pretty aggressive. Mm-hmm. And is that the type of dog this one was? No, he wasn't aggressive. He was no uh, a shepherd, a German shepherd. Yeah, a German okay. shepherd. Yeah. He was wolf-like. I yeah. actually found. And he was a nice dog. He just didn't like to be messed with by people. Yeah, so he, he didn't, he didn't want yeah, to be touched. Sense. Okay. Uh, I actually found one time where, probably six months before that, he lost a fang. The fang was embedded in the jaws of a wolf. He crushed the wolf's jaws. They locked jaws, and I thought he, I, I saw him laying there in the yard. You know, he kind of wagged his tail when I came in. And I thought maybe he'd been hit by a car because I could see some blood. I went over and looked, and the wolf's fang is behind his fang. And I didn't know what it came from, but there was a sliver of jawbone. Or no, wolf's fang wasn't. His fang was missing. He lost the fang. Mm-hmm. There's a sliver of jawbone missing with the fang. I still thought he got hit by a car. Uh, next day, I see some buzzards circling out in the field across the road, so I go out and check it out in case somebody shot one of the landlord's cows, and there's the wolf, which was about 90 pounds, it wasn't as big as he was. It's laying there, and his fang was stuck behind the wolf's fang, mm-hmm. with that little piece of jawbone still attached. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, doctored him, he could be recovered fine, but he just didn't have that fang. But that tells you this dog don't run. You yeah. know? And he ran from that thing backwards. I've never seen another dog run backwards like that. Right. He was terrified. Uh, you think you got a really uh, close look at whatever it was? Oh yeah, he was yeah. 20 feet when it started walking into the woods right. and he'd already started running backwards. It was probably looking right at him when he charged. Right. I was, this was in 1975, my girlfriend had a horse, it was a gelding, but it was gelded at three years old, so it still thought it was a stallion. Uh, it almost killed a quarter horse stallion down the road one day. Mm-hmm. They, had, they had to pull it away because it had knocked it down several times. This horse was 17 hands, 1,600 pounds. It was Fox Trotter and uh, Tennessee Walker Cross. It was a monster. You couldn't lock your legs on it to hold on. If you were right, trying to ride it bareback, forget it. It bounced you off. Just trotting. Anyway, I'm riding Shannon, got a saddle on. I'm going down from O Highway. There's a road, private road across the field down to Jones Creek Road. I'm riding down the hill. And suddenly, horse stops, ears pointed forward across the fields. And I'm like, come on, let's go. Mm-mm, wasn't budging and like I said he didn't get you know this is a big powerful horse he just stopped he wasn't going any further uh, her sister's dog was with us big chicken took off up the hill big German Shepherd he's gone back up the hill I'm still trying to figure out why he won't go any further and I hear boom like something hit a tree from a distance about a quarter mile away, standing out in the open in broad na- daylight next to this stump that was a, from a huge oak tree, probably four foot across, five foot across. There's about 20 feet of it still standing on the creek bank. And this thing is standing there next to it, probably as big as the one I saw out of BB in 133. But this is broad daylight and it was more of a brown color the other one could have been too, could have been the same one. But it took its hand and boom on that tree again. Turned the horse back up the hill, so okay, let's go. That little valley, uh, people down there have seen them before. There was an incident back 67, 68. Some guys out poaching deer, they spotlighted something out in that field. And uh, when they got to the tavern, one of them had a nervous breakdown. It terrified him so bad. He never would go into the woods again. But I didn't see it, so I don't know. I just know the stories. It made the newspapers. Okay. Is there a lot of stuff that are in a lot of Bigfoot reports in newspapers around here or reports on the BFRO or other sites? 
No, mm-hmm. there's some reports on the BFRO from the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the areas where I know, you know, if they exist, I've seen the evidence. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Highway 17 going north from Tuscumbia to Mary's home, I think it is. Uh, outside of Iberia, Missouri, there's a, a place that sells feed, dog feed, horse feed. Mm-hmm. Truck driver working for them was headed up probably 87, 88, somewhere in there. He's headed up to Mary's home from, from the store with a load of feed. And he encountered one on the highway, right on 17 Highway, uh, standing alongside the road. Hmm. Said it was about seven feet tall. Went back and told him. They're like, yeah, okay, you're full of shit. Right. Uh, I got a glimpse of something in that area one night. You know, people, when they're driving at night, there's no bushes next to the road, hmm. right? Your eye hits a big mass, you automatically think cedar tree, bush, something like that. I turned around after, and it was probably within a mile of where he saw it. His sighting was daylight. What I saw was at night, but I went past, and there's a bush next to the sign. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. I turned around. Well, whatever it was wasn't there anymore, so it was moving. It wasn't a bush. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. 93, 92 or 93. I'd started flea marketing down at Kabul, driving from Dixon on the back highways to Kabul, Missouri, to go to the flea market and set up. Tons of deer along uh, J Highway to coming from Devil's Elbow area down and sometimes I'd take M Highway come out north of Edgar Springs sometimes I'd take K Highway and go on down but it runs along the Piney uh, part of the way and uh, I came down through there one night let me get this right Probably 84, or nine, not 84, 94. I'm coming down through there. I've been seeing tons of deer every time I drive through there, so I drive slow and I'm watching. I saw a mountain lion one night, saw a black bear, saw wolves a couple of times, not coyotes. Coyotes slink, wolves walk like they own the place. And suddenly, uh, made three or four trips, and I'm thinking, where'd all the animals? I didn't see a raccoon, didn't see a possum, didn't see deer, nothing. And I'm like, what the hell? where they all go? Well, it was kind of dry, so I thought, well, maybe they're just down closer to the water. But, you know, it was weird going from seeing 25, 30 deer to not seeing any at all, seeing possums and coons and stuff across nothing. So I come down, headed down to Kabul. I came off the higher land on J Highway, dropping to the bottom along the Piney. There's a big bluff there. There is a Phelps County cop pulled off in the pull-off spot. He's like this inside the car, shining his light up at the base of the bluff like... And I slowed down, and he's like, get, get. I don't know what he saw. I have a good idea what he saw. So anyway, I drove on. Well, after that, I'm thinking, you know, he saw something. So I'm watching the woods more closely. Still not seeing any wildlife at night. None. It's like the area is just void of everything. Uh, Was headed down on a Friday. And uh, I went, instead of going, taking M Highway, and going towards Edgar Springs, I decided to go on down K Highway and come out on 63 north of Licking and take this, you know, quicker route. So 
I see something. I kind of glanced in my rear view. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. Okay. So, um, you were traveling? Traveling south. Okay. I was going up. There's a, we're, we're M Highway, J Highway, and K Highway end, and, or meet up, is at the bottom of the hill. When you turn on M Highway, you're going towards Flat and then Edgar Springs. You stay on K, you come out north of Licking, between Licking and Edgar Springs. That night, I, or that day, I decided I was going to go on up K Highway. And uh, as I was going up the hill, I kind of glanced back for some reason towards the bluff where the Phelps County police officer was shining his spotlight up towards the bluff. I glance back at that bluff and I see like a massive tree stump with a cedar tree in front of it. And I'm, I go on up to the top of the hill and I'm, wait a minute, there's not enough soil for a tree stump that big around. No tree could have grown that, that long to get that size. So I turn back around. The tree stump and the cedar tree. The cedar tree is now laying down at the base of that bluff and the tree stump is gone. It wasn't a tree stump. It was sitting there, it was a cool day, it was sitting there, rock wall behind it, sunning itself. And there is one in that area from what I saw that day and I saw tracks one day in the snow, different time. The thing slid a little bit. I didn't stop and look at the tracks, but uh, I'd say there is one of the big ones down there. And I did one night see one I think was 12 foot tall. I mean, the one out by Dixon that I saw that time going under that pine tree limb, this thing had to be 12 foot tall and over a thousand pounds. Uh, it was carrying a deer by the hind legs with the deer hanging down draped over its shoulder. It was a spike buck and its nose barely reached the thing's buttocks. That's how big it was. Anyway, uh, after realizing that whatever that was sitting in front of that bluff probably was holding that cedar tree in front of it because from down where the pull-off area was where that Phelps County deputy was shining his light up at the bluff that cedar tree would have been perfect for blocking the view from the road which was much closer to it and I've seen videos where chimps and gorillas have used bushes to conceal herself and sneak past a leopard and a lion uh, the chimp didn't have enough of a bush to even conceal himself. There was like three leaves and a stick, but he was sneaking past the leopard. The leopard's belly was descended, so it wasn't even hungry. It didn't even bother looking at him. But you could see that chimp really thought he was doing something because they're not that smart. Whereas this critter is, and it used a full-size bush. Hello. Hello. Anyway, as I was saying, I've seen the videos. The chimp's a lot lower intelligence than a Bigfoot is. Bigfoot uses a full-size bush when they do that, and I've seen it on other occasions. You go back and the bush is laying on the ground where it was standing up. There was something behind that bush holding it up. Sometimes your mind plays tricks when you're driving down the road at night and you think you saw a bush because you saw this big massive shape and no eye shine. And then you turn around and go back, that big massive shape's gone. You know, uh, your mind tells you what you want to see a lot of times. So you see something that huge, you, you see bush, you see a tree. Your mind's playing a trick because you don't want to see what you're actually seeing. And, uh, anyway, uh, driving on that same stretch of road, on J Highway, uh,
probably two or three months different, probably September, October. Still not seeing any deer, but I knew the reason I wasn't seeing deer was because there was a top predator in the area. Uh, I see a deer, but it don't look right because it's hanging head down off of something. Uh, it's being held by the hind legs. It's a spike buck and its nose barely reaches the buttocks on this thing. It was five foot or more across the shoulders. At the time I saw the one over by Dixon at the junction of 133 and B, D, BB, you know, over eight foot tall, four foot, four to five foot wide across the shoulders. That was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. This thing could have broke that one in half. And it just walked off into the woods carrying that deer like I would carry a, a jackrabbit. Uh, probably December, same year, half mile down that road, come around a curve, and I got it in full view of the headlights, 75 feet away. I got the eye shine. It looked like two shaker lights 12 feet off the ground with that bluish white look to them and the eyes were bigger than golf balls. The head was bigger than a basketball. I mean it, it was just huge. It immediately spun and stepped off into the woods probably a six seven foot stride. Uh, it was gone in three steps but I got a real nice look at it. Mm -hmm. The face did not look like an ape's face. It was more human. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine seeing something like that. And, you know, I thought that eight or nine footer was monstrous. It would have been dwarfed. Uh, it's really hard to believe they can be so quiet, but they crawl. You know, they, they, they disappear. Right, right. Well, when we were talking, we went, um, you know, you mentioned Somersville area. Mm -hmm. Okay, Willow Springs is south of Somersville. Uh, I think he said it was 8 Highway that he was on, a friend of mine down at Kabul. They saw one. They came around a curve, saw something laying on the road. And he tried to swerve and miss it, but he ran over either a leg or an arm, and it almost flipped his truck when it jumped up. Uh, his wife says she saw it run off on two legs, but they actually ran over part of it, and it didn't even phase it. But back to uh, you know my own personal sightings and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know I've heard screams. I've been answered. I've seen lots of footprints. I've seen tree breaks. I saw a twisted tree over by Viburnum the other day. The branches were about that big around, up 10, 12 feet high. Something climbed up to do that. And they were twisted like this, and then another tree, there had to have been two of them to do it, shoved in between them to pin them so they stayed like that. Now what that means, I have no idea. But I do believe part of it, what they do when they're breaking stuff down and stuff, they're making places where the deer have to slow down so they can catch them easier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I, I'm seeing so many deadfalls, and you didn't see that when I was growing up. The woods were clean, and those were natural woods. Now you look and there's tree limbs strewn, there's stuff propped up like this. You know, uh, deer's running through the woods looking back over his shoulder at something chasing him. Bam, he runs into something and he's down. Steps in between two logs and breaks his leg. Makes it a lot easier to catch it. Not that they need any help because they're fast. You know, uh, the thing running across the hillside. I saw one down by Norwood, Missouri. I was on the way to Springfield working for a nursing agency. 
it was misting, sleeting, visibility was bad, it was reddish colored, and when it shot across the road in front of me, I'd say it was doing 60, 70 miles an hour. They are that fast. Mm -hmm. You know, deer running full tilt's like standing still compared to them. I had a glimpse where all I saw was one arm as one on Jay Highway turned off into the woods. I saw the complete arm as it disappeared into the bushes, and it was a good eight footer. Uh, south of Port Leonard Wood on Highway 17 by the Ruby Dew. Uh, I saw one that was probably seven, seven and a half foot tall, reddish colored. Uh, the only reason I noticed it was because the guy in front of me locked up his brakes at the bottom of the hill and stopped and was staring off into the, where the cedar trees were that it went into. Uh, got down there, he went over the next hill and I stopped and looked to see if I could see it. Uh, and I've seen optical illusions, people think they see one. There's a spot down by Ava, Missouri, if you're coming down the highway I don't remember what high A might be an A highway there. Anyway, you're coming down the highway and you get to a certain point at the top of the hill and you're looking down the road. Well, there's something standing there. Go a hundred feet down the road, you can't see it anymore. And you're thinking, wow, something was there and it moved. Mm -hmm. Went back, it's in the same spot. I took binoculars with me the next time I went down through there because I'd seen it several times. When I got to where I could see it, I got the binoculars up. And there's a little rise of ground. There's a stump on the other side of that rise of ground as you're following the road. You can see it, and then you can't see it. And that's all it was, was an optical illusion. But it looked exactly like the bulky head and shoulders. Mm -hmm. uh, down at, by Willow Springs in 2004 or 2005, I saw one standing on a power line. Massive head and shoulders, broad daylight. He's standing there looking off into the woods away from the road on the other side of the power line cut. That's something. Oh, he's standing in the power line strip? Yep. Okay. Standing right there. He probably weighed four or 500 pounds. He was mm -hmm. massive, but he wasn't that tall. What color was this individual? It was a brown, brown and blonde. You know, the hair, some of the hair had faded out. This is in August. Mm hmm. Now, did he have the dark, smaller eyes or the big? I didn't get a look at oh, the front. Okay, I got a he look was at the, the back of his head, walking. shoulders, and he, no, he was standing still. Okay. By the time I got turned around, though, and came back, he was gone. Right. Okay. Yeah. But he was watching something down in the woods, mm -hmm. and he had his back to me, and you know, and it's like, did I just see that? So I turned around, and went back. Yeah, I saw it because it wasn't there. Right. You know. Uh, too much detail for it not to have been. You something. know something was standing in that power line strip. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you could see the shoulders. You know, you could see the definition in the back, mm -hmm. the muscles in the back and stuff. You could see everything in good detail, mm -hmm. but it was facing away. Right. Uh, saw a black bear in a tree down by Dora, Missouri, in 2008 or nine. Black bear is the very top of the tree. And it was like that possum was that night up by Dixon. The black bear is shaking the tree. There's nothing above him. He's at the very top as high as he can go. Mm -hmm. And he is literally shaking so much, he's shaking the whole tree. And it was 30, 35 feet up. So I'm looking to see if I can see anything. Well, there's a little side road right there. And as I come around the curve, I'm looking back to that side road I saw one step off into the woods, and I swear the back, the coloration, looked exactly like the the made-up guy on Harry and the Hendersons, the muscle definition and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so close to that. The grayish color, uh, head didn't stick up as high, it wasn't as pointed as the thing in Harry and the Henderson with the makeup, but uh, it was quite similar to that. It was tall, it was slim but it had the broad shoulders and the muscle definition. It was definitely a Sasquatch. Right. Uh, no doubt about it. But that's why that black bear was up in the tree. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Because they will kill and eat a black bear. I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, okay. 
2014, a friend of mine who at one time down at Knobloch Lake, south of Mountain Grove, Missouri, used to go out and scare people. Uh, he called me, and knowing he hoaxed people in the past with a gorilla suit, I was skeptical, but I went out with him. He wanted to show me a track he'd found by a pond, and he had pictures of it. Uh, went down, took a look, didn't find those tracks. They were already obliterated by the cows. Did find a couple others, though, and I had a picture of one of them on my phone at the time. And I don't have it anymore. The phone broke. Uh, anyway, we went walk, walking around for a while, and then we went down driving the back roads, you know, just looking for sign. And uh, the reason I went with him wasn't just a track. He was taking a friend of his down to, there's so many mills down there, I don't remember which one. Anyway, the water was up on the uh, Jack's Fork. That's where the mill was located. Water was up so they couldn't go to the mill and they stopped and they were looking where the water covered the low water bridge and he told his buddy he said uh, I want to try something so he smacked a signpost with a big piece of wood that was laying there got an immediate two rocks banged together up on top of the hill looked up and saw it and he looked around to tell his buddy look up there his buddy was already had already covered the 75 feet up to the road and was come on let's go let's go and he said that one disappeared out of sight he said I banged a, the signpost again and he said something else banged one downstream and he said that was enough for me I, I left you know, like I said knowing he's a hoaxer I took it with a grain of salt and uh, he calls me and he said, uh, hey, let's go out and take another look. So we go out driving around. We did some calls in places. Uh, I went as close as I could to the Ohio Howl on the way back to Mountain Grove. Oh! And I got one back in return about twice as long. I scared the hell out of a deer, it went up over the edge of the bluff, and as it was clattering up through there, I heard him fumbling with the door to the truck, which is about 30 feet away. <laughs> He's like, let's go, let's go. I said, no, nah, I think that was a wolf that answered us. And I blasted another one, and it had probably covered an eighth of a mile in that amount of time, just, you know, half a minute, minute. The thing was moving our way fast. When it called the second time, it wasn't 300 yards away. And uh, we decided it was time to go home. The reason we stopped there, this is about a mile out of Mountain Grove, heard coyotes. They were, they were getting close to town, and they woke me up one night. I lived in town. Uh, they woke me up, so I went out on the porch and I'm listening to the coyotes thinking, damn, I wish there was a lion around because that would shut them up. There was a guy up in Kansas City had a full grown male African lion in his yard and when the dogs got too loud at night, all of a sudden it would roar, one roar. No more dog, dog noises the rest of the night, they shut up. Anyway, uh, I was thinking, damn, I wish something would tell him to shut up and about that time, I heard that long drawn out moaning howl sounded just like the Ohio howl. It was in the distance, but the coyotes ceased immediately. And that's why I, I tried to imitate that and uh, it worked. I got a response. Yeah. And they already had the four toed creature that flipped the rocks over. Mm -hmm. That yeah, was the what the Native Americans called the bear people. Uh, Can you uh, describe the bear people as far as your knowledge that you have on it from stories or Native well, American stories I've or people actually, that you've talked to? I've actually to? seen in 1967 in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, out on the outskirts of Kansas City, uh, 
Let's see, Nolan Road. There's Blue Springs Parkway on, on off of Nolan Road. Nolan Road runs from Raytown all the way to Independence. In 67, there were open fields on both sides, woods, trees, blackberry thickets. You know, it was it was farmland basically that was overgrown and they're not coming in. Yeah. Anyway, uh, a lady and her boyfriend were driving down Nolan Road headed north towards Independence. Uh, there's a police station probably a mile, maybe less, from the from the Blue Spring Cemetery, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they blew a tire. The guy gets out, walks back, going to change the tire. The spare is flat. They're less than a quarter of a mile from a gas station. And it's 11, 12 at night, so nobody's coming along. He goes back, got the tire out, walks back up, tells her, he said, you can walk with me or stay here with the doors locked and I'm gonna go ahead and roll the tire up to the gas station and air it up. And she says, no, I'm not walking at night. He gets a little ways away from the car and he comes back and he said, hey, I think I see a little black bear up there. I'm gonna go up and get a closer look. And she's like, no, come on, go ahead and take the tire down there. Let's get the hell out of here, I wanna go home. He said, well, take it a second. So he leans the tire up against the car and he walks that way, he goes up the hill towards the Blackbird thicket. Uh, gets about halfway to it, maybe 200 feet, it stands up. When it came after him, it let him get to a tree. The girl, when they got her tranquilized enough to get the story out of her, it would let him get up to the first limb and start pulling himself up and then take his claws, put them in his back and yank him down off the tree and then let go and let him do it again. And the girl is sitting in the car watching this. Police officer pulls up, stops to see what's going on. She's hysterical. While he's tapping on the window trying to get her to calm down Police cars behind this car with the flat. She looks up, points up the hill. He looks up. This thing's now coming down the hill at him. He didn't even see the body up there because it was so mangled. He empties his 38 into it as it's coming at him. She unlocks the door. He jumps in the car with her. She slides over. He hits the key. They drive that car with the flat tire in. When they got a bunch of officers rounded up, they come back out. Uh, the police car is demolished. There's claw marks through the metal down the side of the car that he, that he drove to the police station in. It went right through the side of the car with those four claws. Anyway, they got police officers from all over the area. They got, there's a hunting club back then in Kansas City. They had bear dogs of their own. They took out to... Uh, Colorado, Utah, wherever, to hunt bear. And these are big mastiff crosses. They're like 180, 200 pounds a piece. They don't back down from a grizzly. Mm -hmm. They bring them out there. They bring hounds. Mm -mm, don't smell nothing. They said you could smell the scent in the air. The thing stunk. Hounds don't acknowledge the trail. Kind of like uh, when somebody disappears in a state park, the hounds refuse to track. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, a couple of guys from the Kansas City Police Department come out. They got off duty. They heard about it. They come out there. They got their German Shepherds in the car. Uh, these dogs are inside the car. They reached in and snapped chains on them or leashes on them, leads, because these dogs are wanting out. They're wanting at it. Uh, they drove or they dragged the guys through the brush and stuff, tracking it to Independence, to a little spring, and. I actually played around that spring with my cousin. Uh, anyway, they took turns holding on to the dogs because they were pulling so hard. When they get there, this thing charges and the dogs decided, oops, we made a mistake and they, they took off. Right. Uh, they emptied everything they had. There were guys with high-powered rifles, uh, riot guns, 
their pistols. They unloaded on this thing, and from what I heard, there were like 127 rounds fired through this thing. When the final round was put in its head, it was still with the one arm that wasn't all shot up, trying to drag itself towards them. Hmm. I mean, it was like it had rabies. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I didn't even remember. I vaguely remembered something going on. I was talking to one of my cousins, and she lived there in Kansas City at the time. She said, uh, no, I can tell you what it was. She said, they had it on the table, a big long operating table in the Muehlbach Hotel in the lobby, and they had zoologists and anthropologists from the Museum of Natural History in Kansas City, guys from the zoo. They had all kinds of specialists in there. They had the thing laid open on the table, rib cage showing, and they were bagging organs. Okay? Uh, they actually had that on the news. The reporters were in there, the cameras were going. Uh, all of a sudden, guys in suits come in, and they start going like this with a badge and then shutting the camera down. If you go up there now and look at the Kansas City Star, all, the only thing you will find mentioned on that, uh, you'll find a mention in a smaller section because it's been edited. It says two guys were dressed up in a monkey suit scaring people in the Nolan Road area, one of them sitting on the other one's shoulders. Uh, you'll find a, a riot between newscasters, reporters, and police, no mention of the guys in the suits. And on the 10 o'clock news that night, they said it was two guys in a monkey suit. That was your cover story. Right. Okay. And when my cousin told me this, I kind of thought she was pulling my leg, but I kind of remembered the thing had a muzzle like a bear. It was tall and thin. It had the rib cage shaped more like a dog or a bear, not a, you know, rib cage like a man. Uh, had claws. Saw the one paw had claws on the end of the four fingers. There was no thumb, and the feet were sticking up, and they were four-toed with claws. Uh, that's all I vaguely remembered, but I, I remember seeing the ribs. So it wasn't two guys in the suit because they had the animal cut <clears throat> open. Okay. Probably eight foot tall. I'd say three to four hundred pounds. It wasn't massive. And this was in the Kansas City area. Yep. 1967. Okay. She told me that. She said, well, go up to Kansas City, ask anybody. Mm -hmm. So I went up and asked people that she didn't know that I knew, and they said, you don't remember? I said, I remember it real well. And, uh, you know, they told me the same story she did, same description that I, you know, as I was hearing people talk about it, I began to remember bits and pieces of what I saw. And I remember basically uh, one of the reporters not giving up his camera and the guy snatched a cop's baton out of his hand and that camera went in a million pieces because he smacked it. That's what started the fight between the reporters and the guys in the suits because they were, you know, guys got six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar, you know, Nikon cameras and shit and they're busting them up, mm -hmm. taking the film out of them. Those guys got pissed. Right. You know, that's what they made their money with. Yeah. So. Um, where did you see the Forto creature? Okay. I didn't see the one that tore the rocks out of the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, 2005 or six, no, for that, 2004 mm -hmm. probably, I was driving up the Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, my son was with me. We were going to pick up his mom because she was working up there. We lived in Iberia, Missouri. We're going up Highway 42, and just before the turnoff, Republic Beach Number One. We're coming around the curve. This thing is standing in the ditch. Ditch is about 18 inches deep. This thing was a good six foot tall, and I would say probably seven and a half to eight foot tall because it was standing down in the ditch and it was at least six foot to the top of its head from the road surface. Can you describe every feature you can remember to us? I can remember the head was quite similar to a bear's head, 
but the muzzle was shorter, broader, uh, stronger looking jaws. It had ears on the side of its head, just like the one they shot in Kansas City. Looked almost identical to it. And as we came around the curve and saw it, it started looking at us like. And the impression my son and I both got at the same time is it's shaking its head trying to tell us we don't see it. Because hmm. we could feel it projecting some kind of thought. And that was what we both came up with. It was trying to say, you don't see me. Mm -hmm. And looked back and it was hightailing it down towards the river, or the, the Grand Glaze. Right. Or is it? No, it's, yeah. Anyway, it was high, hightailing it towards the lake. Okay. You know, one of the streams that went into the lake. What color was the individual? Dark brown. Dark brown. Dark brown. Okay. Thinner hair up here. Uh, face was completely hair covered. wasn't wasn't ape shaped at all. What did the eyes look like? Uh, they were dark. Didn't reflect because we didn't hit them with the headlights. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd say they were either dark brown or completely black. Didn't see any iris. Mm -hmm. The nose was more bear-like. Uh, when it stood, it looked like it would be comfortable. I've seen a dog stand on its hind legs, not like a chihuahua, but the arms hung down, you know, similar to how a dog's arms hang, legs, front legs hang down when mm -hmm. they're standing So up. it was very awkward. Yeah, very awkward. So maybe awkward. It, did, it wasn't always on its hind legs, like no. maybe it used all fours. Mainly. It looked like it would be comfortable either way right okay uh didn't i don't know if it had a tail or not i don't know the thing in kansas city didn't so that one probably didn't either now there's a an ice age creature that i believe is called the bear dog and it's kind of like a wolf with a bear mm -hmm. it's got the head of a bear and yeah. do you do you suspect that it could be the same type of creature or just something completely different? No, uh, I can't remember the name of the book or who wrote it. It was about the Ice Age, and the guy described the creature, he called it the Wanawut. Said it had a muzzle like a bear, walked on its back legs, totally demonic. That goes, he might have heard the same thing from an older Indian that I heard. They said that, you know, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, they said, that's the forest people. That was their term was, you know, the wild man, the forest people. They, they, con they considered them a tribe, a people. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, this thing, uh, the old Indian said, we believe, I do, that they are a cross between a man, a bear, and a demon. That's his exact words, man, bear, and demon. They hate every living thing. And they're totally, totally evil. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did they say about the Bigfoots and the bear people? Supposedly both of them existed in the Rockies at one time all over the continent. And the Bigfoot went on a crusade to get rid of them. They chased them across the plains. They're, they're left, few escaped into, you know, the eastern part of the country, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana. I don't know how far they went, but uh, there were none left in the Rockies. So you're saying the Sasquatches went to battle with yeah. the bear people? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is an incident that was reported in, uh, might have been in Omaha, Nebraska. They printed a, somewhere up in one of, the, one of those states, I think it was in Omaha, they printed a story from British Columbia from a newspaper up there that uh, the natives were saying, stay out of the mountains right now. The two races of giants are fighting each other and some trapper went out in a canoe, was gonna go ahead and run his trap lines and he got chased out. And they said that was a, there was a war going on between the two races of, of giants, big people. Mm -hmm. and they didn't tell what they were in that article. Right. 
But uh, makes you wonder. Yeah, it does because there there's too much going on out there. You know, there's too many times that Sasquatch people have testified, told their story. A Sasquatch rescued them from a bear, from wolves, from mountain lions. You know, there's a, there's even an incident in Mississippi. Uh, young guy, young kid, his neighbors had a bull that would kill you. Mm-hmm. Well, he didn't realize it was loose in the pasture. He was going out to the pond to go fishing or something and realized, oh, shit, that bull is in here and he's between me and the fence. So he started running. The bull is after him. And it was a longhorn, or one with big horns anyway. His grandpa is coming off the road, pulling up the driveway, and he's flooring the truck up the driveway to try to get there. He's, he's reaching back and trying to pull the gun down while he's driving. And all of a sudden, he hears the bull hit the ground. He hadn't got to the fence, but he stumbled because he heard the noise behind him. He looks back, and there is a female Sasquatch has broken the bull's neck, and she stomps on its head three or four times to make sure, looks at him for a minute. He gets up and runs onto the fence and climbs over the fence, and his grandpa said, you're lucky. Yeah, that's incredible. He said... She's been watching over you for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, the little boy in the Carolinas a couple of years ago, they taught him to say he was with a bear for the three days he was out in the cold. Yeah, back. A black bear, wintertime, it's hungry. Mm-hmm. It's going to eat him. Right. You know, they taught him to say it was a bear. Yeah. In 2010, I was set up at Jacob's Cave in November, or no, October, the last setup of the year. It's a big bird and animal swap meet. Uh, 25, 30,000 people through the day, two or 3,000 vendors sometimes. It's basically an encampment. People have campfires going. I'm set up, this is October one, the last one of the year. And it was kind of a frosty morning and Something about 3 o'clock in the morning woke me up. There was ground fog. And this is off of the lake, just a little ways, a couple miles, three miles. There's ground fog. It's about a foot off the ground, and then it only goes up about four or five feet. So I'm looking around, trying to figure out what woke me up, and I could sense something. I could feel something was moving around between the vehicles. Everybody's asleep. I thought about going out and I was like, no, I'm just gonna zip my sleeping bag up and and I'll go back to sleep. Be prepared to shoot if something tries to get in. So I'm laying there and everything calmed down. That was just a weird feeling. Don't know if anything was there or not, but I had, I just had this feeling something was walking through, looking at everything, looking at us, and it wasn't a person. The next year, in June, I'm set up on a different location. I'm set up on the, they have a new perimeter road. I'm set up on the edge of that perimeter road. This is 2011. Uh, Three o'clock in the morning, Something woke me up, and I'm like 150 feet from the other side of the road where the wood line is. So I I get up, I get out of the van, and I'm just kind of watching, see what's going on, see if anybody's stirring or anything, nobody's moving. I start to get back in the van, and I I hear the traditional whoop howls from the lake area, from down off the on the lake. Mm And while I'm listening to them, I'm scanning around again. I still haven't got back in the van. 
and I look across that perimeter road to the north, and there's some cedar trees right on the other side of the perimeter road. They're not very big, they're like 10, 12 feet tall. There's a 20 foot tall sapling behind them and it starts violently whipping back and forth and there's no wind blowing, nothing else is moving. And the top of that tree is whooping eight to 10 feet back and forth. Couldn't see what was doing it because it's behind those cedar trees. And my first thought was, wow, go take a look. And then my second thought was, no, wait a minute. It knows I'm looking. I'm not going to investigate. I got back in the van, locked the doors, and went back to bed. Didn't see anything except that tree moving like that and something with a lot of power had to be whipping it back and forth. 93 or 94, lived uh, outside of Dixon, out in the country, north of Dixon a little ways. I had a 130 pound Rottweiler and Airedale cross. Uh, Danny seemed like he was indestructible. Pitbull jumped him. It took him like three or four minutes to realize the Pitbull wasn't playing and get serious. And I got there in time to keep him from killing it. Uh, I had a lab that was not exactly sane. He was in a fight with one of the wolf shepherds I had and just reached down while it was chewing on him, picked up the bone they were fighting over and starts walking off while it was holding on to the side of his head. And it like let go and backed up and looked at him and he just kept walking it's like, it was in shock because it was, you know, they wanted to bone, but it wasn't going to fight him if, he could, if it couldn't bother him. So he was a little bit odd. One night, all my wolf shepherds, I had three of them, they were underneath the porch. They had heard, I'd heard something outside. I go out and they're under the porch, looking out from under the porch. The lab and the Rottweiler and Airedale cross, Danny boy, uh, they're staring into a holler in front of the house. So I walk out there. You know, I'm armed to the teeth at this time. Uh, so I walk out there and I walk across the yard, walk across the driveway and start down into the woods. There was an old stack of pallets uh, before you drop off into the ravine. And Danny Boy runs and jumps up on top of the stack of pallets. Buck gets in front of me, that was the lab. Doesn't want me going past him. He's pushing back against my legs. And they're both staring down into the ravine. Well, I heard something down in there, but I couldn't tell what it was. And then I hear a sound that almost sounds like a horse whinnying. Like, me, me. I don't know what the hell it was, but it was big. It walked on up the ravine. Neither one of those dogs wanted to go down in there and tangle with it. Uh, I saw Danny Boy flatten a black bear that weighed about 300 pounds, just charged and slammed into it, knocked it over backwards. They scrapped for a minute and the bear took off, mm -hmm. you know. I'm not used to having dogs that back up from anything. Right. And uh, whatever this was, neither one of them wanted to go down and tackle it. Like I said, the wolf shepherds, all three of them were under the porch. They weren't even coming out when I went out there. Right. And uh, now do you think that the Bigfoots or even the bear people or any cryptid in general, do you believe that they have some type of connection with you? Or do you think it's random that you just happen to be at the right spot at the right time? Or maybe you hang out in a lot of outdoorsy areas. I hang out in a lot of outdoorsy areas. I do a lot of driving over the road at night and stuff. But okay. uh, I think I'm more aware that they're there. I don't think we really have a connection. Uh, I sense when they're around, like mm -hmm. a lot of people do. But I'm not interested in filming them, exposing them. I would like to have a face-to-face face, face, face encounter mm. with a Bigfoot. 
you know, 10, 20 feet away with him in a good mood and me in a good mood. Right. So I can get a good look at him. Okay. You know? Um, now, your personal opinion, do you feel that they're bad or evil in any way? Or do you think that they're good and bad Sasquatches? I think it's just like with human beings. Okay. I so. don't think you can fully trust any, anything or anyone you don't know. Right. Uh, I do believe... For some reason, they have some rules they got to go by, whether mm -hmm. it's their own rules or something else is controlling them. Uh, I think Scott Par Scott Carpenter might be right. They possibly are the Nephilim, which the Nephilim are not in themselves evil. Uh, Bible says this and that. The Book of Enoch says one thing. Then in another place, it says another. Uh, basically, it says they can be good or evil. It's up to them. They make their own choice just like we do. Possibly that's right. Now, we've both uh, heard and seen the missing 411. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Bigfoot or Sasquatch beings are responsible for the 600,000 people that go missing in national parks every year or forested areas? I think, um, personally... I think if you shoot one, you're probably going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, the relatives are going to take care of you if you kill it. I don't believe they're going to let that go unpunished. Uh, if you shoot one of them that's an outlaw, they're probably going to ignore it. You know, uh, I don't think they are responsible for very many disappearances. Now, the Native Americans are bad groups of them. The Lovela Cave, they burned them out. You know, the Paiutes walled the cave in and filled it with brush and burned them out. Mm -hmm. I believe that really happened. I believe there was a group of something, Sasquatch-type cre creatures that, you know, uh, they were cannibals. They ate other, other people. Mm -hmm. I don't think Sasquatch does as rule, but people have turned to cannibalism when they've been wrecking mountains and stuff, you know, on a plane. They've ate each other. Right. Uh, I don't think they're any more or less susceptible to doing bad things than we are. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the stuff, uh, like I, I've said to Steve, I think sometimes when they're throwing rocks and stuff or they're doing bluff charges at you, they're breaking limbs, maybe that's a threat display. Sounds more like a bluff to me. Uh, Maybe they're trying to get you out of the area before something else does get to you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been like the one guy up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, truck driver. That he he has no doubt that one saved him. The guy, uh, the the guy that was, or the guy that went out to shoot the mountain lion, it was killing the guy's livestock, and mountain lion had dead to rights. Sasquatch grabbed it, jumped down behind him, broke its back, looked at him, and left. He said, I know it saved my life. Right. He so said, you, what you're saying, you think maybe sometimes the rock throwing is some of the juveniles or females maybe letting you know, get out of here. I got a little the big one. males are around or maybe something's not right. They got a little one around. They don't want you bothering it. You right. Know? There's, there's, there's many reasons they could be doing that. Yeah. Uh, I think they want to be left alone, mm -hmm. you know. Do you What's, believe that they have spiritual abilities or some type of power that we are not aware of? They have a vocal range that is far greater than ours. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt what I believe was in for sound at one time out at Shawnee Mac Lake. Uh, it, it just hit like I ran into a wall and all of a sudden the sound was dead. And my girlfriend was saying, well, come on, let's go. And I said, no, we're not going past this tree. We're not going past. We're going to turn around and we're going back. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really afraid. I just knew it was not a good idea to go on. Right. And can they communicate with us? Yeah, it's possible. Now, as far as them just disappearing out of thin air or the lights, the orbs, do you feel that is the Sasquatch beans or do you feel that's re relevant at all? I think maybe the orbs are something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
if the orbs are, are good or bad, if they're bad, maybe the Sasquatch is trying to protect you from the orbs. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, maybe the Sasquatch have the ability to project them to hypnotize us or something. I don't know. Yeah. I know they have a high intelligence. Uh, they live in a natural world. Uh, I saw a deer come out one night out of, out of grass, out of a ditch that wasn't 12 inches tall. Mm -hmm. Full grown deer popped out of there, almost hit it, and there's no way it could have hit. We went back and looked, and you could see where it had been laying, but we couldn't see it until it jumped up. Right. You know, uh, I've seen where a deer crawled in. It looked like a rabbit hole going into this uh, buck brush. Mm -hmm. And my cousin and I had walked through that field. We saw the rabbit holes and stuff. We were bored. We were deer hunting, but we were bored, and it was close to lunchtime, so we tossed some rocks in there. Yeah, we'll scare one up out of here. Nothing moved. So we went up on the hillside. We're sitting there watching these other two guys come in at this angle across and they poked around in there and stuff. The pile of buck brush is mm, probably 15 feet across. And it's not that thick. We didn't see anything in there. We just bored, so we threw rocks in. They poked sticks in there and stuff. Okay, they go on off across the field. These other two guys are coming in, walking kind of towards us, and a little bit different angle. One of them tosses a rock in there, and they almost got ran over by this eight point buck as it exploded out of there. When it were, we went back and looked, we're all, all six of us, there's two guys in each group, we're all standing there. How the hell did it get in there? Cause it, you know, it exploded out of there, it tore a big hole coming out, but we still couldn't find the entry. The only thing we could find was a little hole about that big around, we thought rabbits went in. I have seen deer lay down, tilt their head, and wiggle through a hole, you'd swear. Their hand, their horns expand it as they're going through. They wiggle on through. They have amazing abilities too. So what you're saying is that the Sasquatch are so agile, so in tuned to nature that it appears that they're supernatural. I believe that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you describe the belly crawl incident that you yeah. experienced? Yeah, I was over going to bunker first time or second time i was over there this was in i'd say probably in november october or november it was leaves were falling and stuff uh i'm still trying to remember figure out the exact location i should have stopped right then but i didn't i have a deer walks out in front of me a doe she walks out in front of me she, she or well she was already in the road when i came around the curve anyway I came to a stop. She's not blinded by the headlights. I, I no longer believe that has anything to do with reality. She's looking back and forth like she's afraid to go off the road. That's the impression I got. So finally, I'm stopped for a couple of minutes. Finally, she walks off on this side. Still didn't go into the trees though. She's still looking and sniffing. As I start to go past her, something, you know, just made me look the other way. I look, and in my side mirror, I see this thing come off the bank, across the road, faster than I could run, and it is crawling on its belly. Its arms are spread out like this. It has long, flowing hair, and the hair is blowing in the wind. But its back legs were almost not quite straight out. It was like it was only using the muscles in its ankles and feet. The back legs were kind of bent as it came across the road. And I glanced the other way, the deer had disappeared. I glanced the other way and see it in my side mirror on the right side of the car just as it transitions upright. I am sure it was a Sasquatch, even though the angles were all weird for looking at it when it came off the embankment. Did it scare the hell out of you when you saw that? No. No? Okay. No, I was more like, that is the weirdest way of movement I've ever seen. Right. You know? Yeah, you were more focused on yeah. what you were looking at. The details. Yeah. And it was not a it was not an ape face, it was more of a human face. It had a lot of long hair on its face. 
uh, it was definitely in top shape. Yeah. You know, right along the same spot, I've seen a probably a 300-pound hog that definitely wasn't a, a, they they transform when they go wild. This one's obviously been wild for a while because it had the razor back and everything. You're talking about the hogs. Yeah, the okay. hog. And in Arkansas, Louisiana, they'll tell you, Sasquatch like hogs. Mm-hmm. They'll eat them. They like goats too. Yeah. Do you think the Bigfoots have to teach the young ones how to live, or do you think from the moment of birth they are instilled with that information within a week or two of no, being no. alive? Do you think they automatically know they are, to do? They are taught. They're taught? They are well taught. Uh, just, okay. just like we teach our, our children. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, I think human beings have some instincts. Mm-hmm. I think they probably are more in tune with nature when they're born than we are, but we are pretty much in tune with nature when we're born. We are taught to veer away from it. We're taught to think differently. Yeah. They are not. They are allowed to develop fully. Mm-hmm. Without something throwing huge rocks into the water, and I asked them, well, really, uh, how big were the rocks? Oh, they probably weighed 50 pounds. How far were they thrown? Oh, they were probably thrown two, three hundred feet. I said, uh, so what throws rocks without thumbs? And they're like, uh, 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 well, they have no, no Sasquatch. Yeah, right. And that's, a uh, old boys down by Somersville? That's down by Mountain Grove. Or that's down over by Mountain Mike Grove. Dixon. That's all over the place. And you're saying they're hunters? Big time hunters that say yeah, Sasquatch no, isn't real. There's nothing. No, out. they just they 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 don't want to talk about it. Mm. Okay. You know, uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about it for fear of ridicule. Mm-hmm. My buddy that told me about the one down by Summersville laying on the highway that he ran over, uh, he wasn't going to say anything. But I was talking to somebody else, and his wife said, "Come on, Dan, tell him about what we saw." And he said, well, you saw it better than I did. I was just trying to keep the truck from flipping after it jumped up. Mm-hmm. And she said, he don't want to admit it, but he told me it looked like a big foot. And she said, that's what I saw. She said it was about eight foot tall. And we ran over either an arm or a leg, and it almost flipped the truck when it jumped up. And it ran off into the woods. Yeah. You know. Uh, I got a buddy that lives out in Oregon. Or Washington, rather. Uh, he sent me a picture. He thought he had something prowling around. Well, he found the mountain lion footprints right up next to his window where it looked in the window. Mm-hmm. But it sounded like something bigger was moving around out there. He wears a size 13. He's got a picture of his foot next to the track. Yeah. And the track's that much longer than his foot and quite a bit wider. Right. You know, his girlfriend found that one and he took a picture and sent it to me. They're all over. Right. You know. And you've never been one to just be worried about taking pictures or providing evidence for someone. You know what you saw and that's all you need, right? Yep. That's all I need. And what you're doing here, you're just wanting to tell people your encounters in case they experience it or experience it in the future. I tell everyone, if you got little kids... Nine times out of ten, and that's only nine times out of ten, if you see five toed tracks, those children are probably safer right then than they are with you protecting them. Because they don't seem to want to hurt children. They lo- they like listening to them. Mm-hmm. You know, they like hearing the sound of laughter. I'm sure that the females, they lose one every once in a while. Uh, Steve Isidall had a guy the other day talking about the same things are taking some of them, their little ones, that are taking human beings in the parks. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy sounds, in some ways, sounds like a nut, but maybe he does know something we don't know. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. I'm open to hearing anything anybody's got to say, unless I know for a fact they're bullshitting. Okay. What uh-huh. do you know about the Native Americans talking about when they talk about shape shifting and to spiritual entities and demonic entities. Does that, do you put Bigfoot in that category? No. No, okay. What about the the bear guy, the, the bear people? 
I think it's completely evil. I really do. Mm -hmm. That's the impression I got when I saw that one. The thing in Kansas City, when it went on its rampage after the first cop shot it, mm -hmm. uh, there, was, there was a gas station 20 years ago, it was still there, it may not be now, but they parked cars waiting to be worked on on top of the gas station. This is right on Nolan Road. Mm -hmm. When this thing went through there on its rampage, I mean, it was tearing fences down, all kinds of shit. It flipped cars off of the top mm -hmm. of that roof onto the pavement below. So it's more of a paraphysical being, I guess. It's a both. I don't know exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And it may be a physical being too, but it's a physical being with a totally maniacal attitude. You know? Okay. Uh, it's just it's filled with hate. Yeah. Hyenas are supposedly something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they're organized, they work together in packs, but uh, they've got a different attitude. They do. Mm -hmm. Some bears do. Mm -hmm. uh, the bear, the bear guy. I can't. Uh, Tim whatever his name was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, oh, I can go out and live with him and everything. Took his girlfriend along, they both made a sandwich for one bad bear. Mm -hmm. And on the video, before they got eight, he says that's a bad bear. He knew it, they should have left then. Yeah. And I don't know what he was thinking of, but he didn't, and they both died. Right. Uh, if you know the animal's bad, I'd put a bullet in it. I don't have a problem, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. But uh, I think our government knows a lot more than they're saying about a lot of this stuff. And for various reasons, all having to do with money or power, they don't want to acknowledge anything. You know, game warden down in Oklahoma, he's driving down the road, a deer pops out in front of him. The road is built up like a dike, and there's fields on both sides that are lower than the road. The deer jumps up on the road and starts running down the road directly in front of his vehicle. Mm -hmm. He said, that don't make no sense. He said, and I just, I thought, you know, it's, it's trapped. And I look over and he said, there's something big and hairy standing over there and there's another one on that side. And he said, the impression I got was they were both pissed off at me because I interfered with their hunt. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Right. You know, uh, there was a guy in West Virginia, and I can't remember what site that was on. He shot a deer. Him and his buddy were hunting. He shot a deer. There's snow on the ground. This thing walks out calmly, picks up his deer, looks at him for a minute. He said his buddy started raising his rifle, and he said, I pushed the rifle down because it wasn't big enough. He said, I laid mine down against the tree and told my buddy, put your rifle down. And he said it looked at him for a minute. And I don't remember if he raised his hand or whatever, but anyway, he said, it turned around, started to walk off, took two or three steps, and it had the deer up on its shoulders. And he said, all of a sudden, it just went like this and dropped the rear half of the deer on the ground for him and walked on up the hill with the front half. Hmm. Yeah. He said, it split the deer in half and laid me, left me half. Yeah. He said, so tell me that's not a thinking, reasoning being. Right. He knew I was hunting for me, my family. He was either hunting for himself or his family. Yeah. He shared. Yeah, there, there seems to be a kindness to, to the mm -hmm. Bigfoot beings. Or a fairness. A, sense a fairness, of fairness, yeah. And they try to reach out to us and communicate with us in a different way than maybe humans do. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their way of communicating isn't like us, you know, physically face-to-face. They don't want that necessarily. Not all the time. Yeah, I think that's maybe, just a rare thing. Well, on the Nephilim thing that uh, Scott Carpenter has going, that, mm -hmm. that may be true. Yeah. And if they're Nephilim, they're probably not supposed to talk to us. They're not supposed to interact. Right. You know. Yeah, it seems like there's a cosmic rule or something. Yeah. That maybe we don't the understand. angel. Maybe the angels are watching over and they're going to step in and think mm. it's gone. Yeah. Uh, the other half of it, if they are descended from the fallen angels, the fallen angels are just as powerful as angels, you know? Mm -hmm. That's probably what's making people disappear, if that's the right scenario. Yeah, I've thought about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We made a delivery last year to Davisville. 
there's a culvert that goes under the railroad tracks that you drive through. It's the biggest culvert I've ever seen. Our box truck fit through it. Mm -hmm. The house that we had to deliver to is past the railroad tracks, so we had to drive through the culvert. It's the first house on the right after we get past there. There's a small power line that cuts, cuts across there. We went in, unloaded what we had to take in. I don't even remember what it was. I'm standing out there waiting at the back of the truck for John to come out, the guy I work with. And I'm looking down the power line and I see, I'm either seeing the wind moving leaves or I'm seeing something big leaning out from behind the tree and I can't tell which it is because it's fairly windy. So I turn around, John comes out, I turn around and talk to him. I look back and there's nothing where the, by the tree where the leaves were moving, but there's something going down the power line walking. Mm -hmm. And it was walking fast, but it was just walking, but it was covering a lot of ground. Yeah. I came back in the town, got off work, I went to talk to him at Rary. And when I mentioned Davisville, uh, he said, oh yeah, I've been out there several times. He said, through the culvert? I said, yeah. He said, exactly where I've been to. There's a lot of activity out there. Okay, the culvert, it, that's in, like, is there like a little community in Davisville? Okay. There's a Davisville store. You drive past the store, go out the gravel road, I can't remember what the road number is, but you turn on, turn off the road you're on, on and go up over a hill, and then you go out past this, you drive past this, uh, these railroad tracks, you go underneath them through this big culvert. Mm -hmm. And that's the area where Earl had been out investigating. Uh, I failed to mention the one a couple of years ago when I was coming back from Jacob's Cave. I told Earl about this one, okay? It was the October show two years ago. I'm coming back. I went through Dixon, went through Jerome, Missouri, coming around the bluff after crossing the Gasconade at Jerome. I had a call blast from the side of the road it wasn't a scream, it was a two-syllable like a word. What? But it was so loud, it felt like it hit me in the side of the head. I had the windows down, and there's no human being could produce that volume of sound. I didn't slow down or anything. It was late at night and I was tired, so I drove on. The impression I got, though, was maybe one younger one was going to step out in the road and the big one yelled to stop it, something like that. I don't know. Uh, I got back to Salem the next morning. I went up and talked to Emmett Reary. And Emmett said, uh, Jerome, huh? I told him exactly where. He said, yeah, I was about a mile from there yesterday or the day before. He said, I was about a mile from there. There was a cedar tree about five and a half, six inches thick that had been broken off, uprooted, and shoved back into the ground about two foot with about four or five feet sticking up. No sign of any kind of power equipment. You tell me what can do that without some kind of heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. He said, and that's less than a mile from where you were at. Oh, well. Wow. So that, you know, that's verification for both of us. Right. And uh, South Mountain Grove on Highway 95 a few years before, I did have the same similar experience. There were open fields on both sides. It was a quarter of a mile to the other fence line where the brush was, and it had to be over there in that brush. And that sound volume was so loud, it almost felt like, the, like that when it was close. Mm -hmm. It just basically felt like I got hit with sound. Right. And it was a whoop. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if I sat and thought long enough, I could probably come up with other oddball stuff that came yeah. up. Because everybody has things that happen out in the woods if they stay out there long enough. 
and they don't know what, they don't know they don't have any idea what it is. Mm-hmm. Once you begin understanding these things are out there, the Bigfoot, the others are out there. Uh, you begin to put stuff together and figure out what it could have been. Right. You know, dogs react to things because they sense more than we do. I got a big, powerful dog that, uh, you know, even my little husky, it sniffed noses with a 200-pound black bear one time. Mm-hmm. I see the dog, you know, uh, he's looking at something and wagging his tail, you know, and it wasn't his aggressive wag. It was like, uh-oh. Yeah. And then the bear sticks its head out of the bushes and they sniff noses. Bear comes on out. I get a good look at it. Dog walks around, pees on something. Bear looks at him like, what are you doing that for? And wanders off. You know, uh, he was terrified of wolves. Yeah. A wolf howling, he'd be in the doghouse shaking. Mm-hmm. Couldn't drag him out, he'd tear your arm off. Right. But whatever it was that was down in those woods behind the high school over at Dixon, where I told you about finding the tracks and stuff, uh, yeah, he didn't even stick around. I was on my own. He was leaving. Yeah. And I've had lots of big, powerful dogs that weren't afraid of anything, saw their reactions. They told me it was time to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, hounds. Hounds are out there. They hunt. They're, they're out there in the woods all the time. When that hound comes running out of the woods, pay attention. There's something to be afraid of. Yeah.